Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Now, there's uh, some announcements. I'll just read them over now to emphasize them. Some very important announcements. Um, some things you know. Touch Powerhouse on today. Go out at the end of the first hymn. That's Sunday school as well. Tea and coffee after the service today. You know about that. GFS and CLB on Monday night, 6.45 and 8 p.m. Dance classes on Tuesday the 8th, uh, to 8 to 10 in the church hall. Items required for an skill and food bank, leave the donations food at the, uh, in the church. And next Sunday morning, the service is usually at 11, and uh, the parish reader in Enniskillen, or the lay reader, Carl Saunderson, will take the service. The Reverend Andrew and Joanne commissioning services tonight at 7 p.m. in Christ Church uh, in Bangor. And the bus is leaving the church car park promptly at 4 p.m. Oma and Fintan, the Methodist Church presents Gospel Fest Go West on Saturday the 24th of February uh, at 7 p.m. in Stool Arts Centre Oma. Admission is £12, tickets only, and tickets available from Struhl Arts Centre or from members of OMA and Fintna Methodist Circuit. The Bible study is on Mark's Gospel starts on Wednesday, the 28th of February at 8 p.m. in the committee room. We're always told at university that Mark's Gospel is really the, the first gospel, though it doesn't appear first in the Bible, and it is... Uh, very, very important gospel and very interesting and quite short, easy to remember it. So hope there'll be a good turnout for that. That's the Bible study on Wednesday, the 28th of February at 8 p.m. in the committee room. Opening praise is the hymn 652, Lead Us, Heavenly Father, Lead Us. Almighty God, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. 
Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to intercede for us in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us affirm our trust in God's mercy and confess that we need forgiveness. Father, you come to meet us when we return to you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, you died on the cross for our sins. <coughs> Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Holy Spirit, you give us life and peace. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, to whom, whose Son, Jesus Christ, fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness and was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Give us grace to discipline ourselves in obedience to your Holy Spirit. And as you know our weakness, so may we know your power to save through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in making us new and contrite hearts that we worldly lamenting our sins and acknowledge in our wretchedness, may receive from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We be seated for the epistle reading this morning, read by one of the congregation. Uh, the theme of the service today for Lent is conversion, drawing nearer to Jesus. Reading from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 18. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and a voice and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but not, did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Taurus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias Come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see him again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's, Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> The Holy Gospel is written in the Gospel according to St. Mark at the 30th verse. Glory, glory be to thee, Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet, when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. With such big branches 
that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let's sing another well known hymn. It's number 219. From heaven ye came, helpless babe. of my lips and meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. (laughs) 
This morning at the beginning of Lent, a season when we try to practice some spiritual self-discipline and draw nearer to the good Lord, uh, I want to look briefly at Mark 4. A simple parable or story Jesus taught to illustrate uh, the Christian life from the beginning. Jesus said to his disciples at a time when they found the Christian path rather difficult. I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed. Sometimes we are worried about the lack of real faith among even church people. Sometimes, indeed, as you well know, our church is criticized for its lack of emphasis on personal faith, personal conversion, being born again, or getting saved, or whatever way you explain it. With the result that some people in the mainstream churches, including our own, are even afraid to use Christian to describe themselves. Some people make the path too easy, others make it too difficult. So here in Mark's Gospel, Jesus compared the Christian life and faith with regards to some people as a mustard seed. Now the point of this parable is quite clear. It points to the fact that given time and the proper surroundings, of course, a tiny seed can grow into a very large plant or even a tree. And it is amazing if you open a packet of seeds and some of them are so small, if you shake or any breath or breathe on them, they blow away. Yet they can grow into a very large tree if treated properly. Therefore, this parable has a special message at that time for the disciples because they were getting a bit bewildered and discouraged. Short time before they had left, some of them left good jobs, others left businesses to go out and become preachers of the gospel. They had hoped for so much, but they found the path a bit more difficult than they had expected. Sadly, opposition was increasing. The road for Christians was becoming very difficult and indeed very dangerous, as it is in many parts of the world today. Now, naturally enough, they were becoming a bit disillusioned and downhearted. So Jesus told them this parable to help them to understand that the beginnings might seem small, but no one knew what they would grow, how they would grow. As they often tell confirmation uh, uh, children when they were preparing for First Communion and to go deeper into the faith and take serious promises, that for too many think that great things should happen, as it were, in the flesh of an eye. In many ways, this parable has a very definite relevance to the question of Christian beginnings or conversion, or getting saved, or becoming a Christian, whatever way you describe it. And I might say that sometimes Ulster Christianity has one great fault. That is the fact that one type of experience is taken as the only pattern to which all experiences must conform. It is a great pity that Christian beginnings, conversion, or whatever way you explain it, has been so often associated with an event, sometimes something which happens suddenly, like a lightning flash. And the experience of Paul on the Damascus Road, which is read very well for us this morning, has been taken as something mistakenly as a standard for all Christian uh, beginnings and ex conversion experiences. But, for a moment, consider where Paul was coming from and what he was doing when he met Christ on the Damascus Road. He was filled with hatred and an evil desire to try and wipe out the name of Christ from that part of the world. And at that moment, he was on his way to Damascus to persecute and to try and close all early Christian churches. 
Remember, too, he was present at the murder of the first Christian deacon, St. Stephen. And what happened to Paul on the Damascus Road that afternoon was indeed a sudden reversal which turned his life upside down. And Paul referred to that many, many times when he was preaching during his long life uh, as a preacher. And he often referred to it. You could say it certainly was Paul was born again on the Damascus Road. And as you would probably know, in early Christian days, many came into the Christian church direct from heathenism. If they had to become Christians at all, they had to make radical changes in their whole way of living and their way of life. For such people, conversion was usually sudden. They were coming from ignorance to knowledge, from darkness to light, very quickly. And that is still the case, not only in missionary situations where some of our overseas missionaries work, but also here in our own community. At special services, and many times I have heard people giving their testimonies and telling about how they've come from darkness to light, like St. Paul. Stories that have really warmed my heart. Stories of drunkards, criminals, agnostics, heathens, sometimes from foreign faiths to accept Christianity. In fact, quite a few of the English clergy that come over here were telling me that they were the only Christians in their whole family circle and that they were suddenly converted when they went to university had very little church by, background uh, through the Scripture Union, I think. But on the other hand, think of a person, young or old, man or woman, brought up in a Christian home, a church home, in what we would hope would be a Christian, or a Christian country, as soon as they would have heard anything, they would have heard the name of Jesus. As soon as they were able to speak, they would have been taught the Lord's Prayer. At four or five, they'd been sent to church and Sunday school, into the fellowship of the church. Never at any time did they seek to destroy the name of Jesus or to try to wipe out the Christian church. There's a radical difference here. In early days, and also today, people came from hostility to Christ, to love Christ, and to get involved in the Christian church. But in the case of people, many people, born into a Christian home, they grow deeper and deeper into Christianity and learn more, obviously, about the Christian faith. As the years go on, their love for Christ and their involvement in church life, maybe teaching the faith, until that person comes gradually to a personal faith and decision with no shattering shock uh, to accept Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord and to get involved in the Christian church, which is the body of Christ. Let none of us think that we have missed something or that we are not proper Christians because we have ha not had this shattering experience like people like Paul on the Damascus Road. Oh, indeed, if you read the early Gospels, you'll find that John the Baptist, he was a man who, not like St. Paul, we read that he loved the Lord from childhood. And you'd have remembered some of the older ones like me, the great American evangelist, not that long dead, Dr. Billy Graham. He conducted many services and missions here, crusades in Northern Ireland. <clears throat> he used to have a question answer in the Christian Herald years ago, and somebody wrote to him once and asked, should I know when I became a Christian? Here's how he answered. Here was the question. Does everyone have to know the exact moment they became a Christian? I know you urge people to make clear decisions to follow Christ at your crusades and missions. But is that the only way to become a Christian? Then the lady went on. I grew up in a Christian home I really feel that I am committed to the Lord, but I can point to a definite time when I choose to become a Christian. 
And here's how the great evangelist uh, answered it. God works in many different ways in the lives of different people. Some people come to faith in a dramatic, sudden moment of decision, while others may only realize at a later time that they have crossed the life line from unbelief to belief and may not even know when that took place. And then, as I was saying, just he took a very simple example. He said, my own wife, for example, she was the daughter of a Christian missionary, Dr. Nelson Bell. Therefore, she grew up in a Christian home where Christ was honored and taught, where the church was attended in Sunday school, and she can never remember a time when she did not believe in God and that God loved her and Jesus Christ was the Savior. On the other hand, although sadly I grew up in a Christian home, I'm afraid I wandered away in my early teens, as many people sadly do. But there came a definite time in my life as a late teenager when I made a clear dis a decision and commitment in Christ uh, at an, an evangelistic rally. Then he went on. The important thing is not the past, but the present. Personally, do you know in your own heart that if you were to meet the Lord at any time, would you be sure of going to eternity? And do you realize that your salvation is not just depends on your goodness, because we can be never good enough, but solely on Jesus Christ and what he has done for you in his death in Calvary. Then he concludes, the important thing is not how we come to faith, but that we have come and that we know for certain we are trusting in the Lord as our personal Lord and Master. And that certainly was a very interesting uh, uh, point and a very useful point that many evangelists seem to overlook. Finally then, your faith may seem small. Your experience of God may seem dull when compared to other people that you may have heard testifying from time to time. When, like the disciples long ago, you do feel downhearted, or the Christian road being difficult, or feel so weak, remember this parable of our Lord Jesus, that for some people, faith is like a tiny mustard seed. It can develop it if it is given the proper chance. And in conclusion, of course, there are many evils in the modern world, as there always were, who are out to destroy the Christian faith. Christians are sadly in the minority, especially when you go away to colleges or universities or out to work. You may be the only one. My grandson pointed out to me at a very large upmarket school, it was only one or two who really went to church. If the mustard seed is to grow, it must, of course, have the proper surroundings. That is why the Christian home is so important, as a school, Sunday school, and the church. God has promised that although your faith and talents may be small, they can grow. Do not be downhearted. Faith must be nourished through prayer, worship, Bible study, and emphasize Sunday worship. The parable of the mustard seed is there to encourage us and to assure us that someday, with the help of God, we may be a blessing to others and leaders in the local Christian church. And certainly we need leaders at the present time. All the churches, sadly the Christian churches, are scratching the barrel for leaders. Full time ordained ministers, we have ordained ladies, and we have, as a Roman Catholic priest said to me when he was complaining, and I said, ordained women, he said, well, you did that, and he says it didn't solve all your problems. Well, fair enough. We also have now part-time ministers, like part-time police. Uh, auxiliaries, or call them lo ordained local ministry. And we have special courses for parish readers and lay readers. So we've been asked uh, to emphasize that point, that our young people should be encouraged, or any age, to think about, as we say, going into the church to spread the faith as a career. 
And now we sing another hymn. This time it is 146. It's up in red, so it may be a different uh, version of the hymn. Turning back to your order of service, just one slight change. This morning we'll just omit the nice creed, Nicene Creed and move over to the next page. Let us pray. <coughs> the prayers of the people. Heavenly Father, we pray for the church worldwide. We all may be loved. Grant that every member of your church may truly and humbly serve you. Amen. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. This morning we remember, of course, first of all, uh, our own, your own parish here now vacant like many others. We pray for God's guidance in the future and we pray for God's guidance too for those nominators who have very serious decisions to make. We remember people who are ill in hospital. Maybe you know families bereaved in this area recently. And above all, we pray for peace, especially remember even our own, our Lord's own country, where there's so much violence and suffering and death. Ukraine, many other places as well. And very often it's the small Christian churches in those areas that are suffering. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we ask you this morning to hallow with your blessing this her parish church. May this church be a place where the sorrowing will find comfort where the tempted will get strength, where the lonely will find friends and fellowship, and where the sinner who repents will be assured of forgiveness, where the faith will find support and grace. And each one offer your holy worship in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Almighty God, we pray for your blessing in all who share in the life and work of this church. We thank God for people who make their talents available, especially at a time of emergency and a vacancy. We think about people too, like your rector here who's left uh, in the ministry of Ward and Sacrament, and sometimes people like him working overseas in dangerous situations. Some people involved in teaching, in teaching Sunday school or in maybe pastoral care. Others in service maybe to the wider diocese of Clogher or involved in the community or those in need. Some of you are involved in ecumenical fellowship and cooperation with other Christian churches in the area. We pray for all members of the congregation that in their very callings they may advance your kingdom, bear witness to your love, shown in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, in your mercy. As we pray for those known to us in need of your touch and in the silence we bring them your to your throne of grace. Stretch out your hand to bring healing to those who are sick, comfort those who mourn, and hope for those in despair. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, our Father, hallowed be heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We do not presume. We do not presume to come to this your table. Even Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, in the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be clean by his body and our souls washed to his most precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. The offertory hymn now is hymn number 447. The Lord is here.
Let us pray. Prayer number three. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, Lord of all creation, we praise you for your goodness and your love. When we turned away, you did not reject us. You came to meet us in your Son, welcomed us as your children, prepared a table where we might feast with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened, he opened wide his arms upon the cross, and with love stronger than death, he made the perfect sacrifice for sin. Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, on the night before you died, you came to table with your friends, taking bread. You broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me every time you eat it. And like... At the end of supper, you took the cup and when you had given thanks, you gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dying you destroyed you so dead. Rising you restored our life. Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Holy Spirit, giver of life, come upon us now, and may this bread and wine be to us to remembrance of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. As we eat, eat and drink these holy gifts, make us know our need of grace, and in Christ our risen Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessed Trinity, with their whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of thanks and praise, and lift our voice uh, to join in the song of heaven, forever praising you and saying, Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Thanks be to you, our God, for your gift beyond words. Amen. Amen. Body for Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this. Take and eat this. Take and eat this. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. The body for our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Take and eat this. Take and eat this. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is shed for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Drink this. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is shed for you, 
Preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Drink this. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Drink this. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful.
Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, you declared your love. Give us grace, open the gate of glory. May we who share in Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink this cup bring life to others to whom this Holy Spirit lights, lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope that you have set before us, and we with all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. To him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and to work to your praise and glory. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.